Good morning, greetings friends, and welcome to The Bright Side, your nutritional program dedicated to the understanding of the vast world of nutrition and nutritional supplementation. I'm your host, pharmacist Ben, nutritional pharmacist from Boulder, Colorado. I use nutritional supplements where other healthcare practitioners use toxic pharmaceutical drugs and sometimes deadly medical procedures. If you suspect that there are natural nutritional roads to your health and vitality and well-being and to addressing your health challenges, whatever they may be, but you don't know where to begin, you have come to the right place. As you listen to The Bright Side every day, you are more and more in control of your body, you are more and more knowledgeable, and you know you can overcome any health challenge. That is why we are here every day on The Bright Side, helping clear up the sometimes confusing world of nutrition and nutritional supplementation. Over the last 32 years of practicing pharmacy, I have seen drug-free recoveries from diabetes, hypertension, obesity, skin diseases like psoriasis and eczema and acne and rosacea, digestive ailments, autoimmune issues of all kinds, recoveries that by the standards of modern medicine can only be called a miracle. But what is in the world of the body, what is in the world of biology, standard operating procedure. Because the human biological system is a healing system, it's a regenerating system, it is designed divinely to heal and renew itself on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, and while some folks may call that a miracle, it really is just the way the body works. If you have questions about health, nutrition, prescription drugs, if you want to wean yourself off your meds and get on a good nutritional supplement program, we are here for you. If you have questions about the longevity products, formulations, ingredients, the health challenge, 844-236-6010 is our number, 844-236-6010. Likewise, if you have a success story you'd like to share or if you want to comment, 844-236-6010. Uh, we'll take your calls at the bottom of the hour or in our next segment. We have a guest at the bottom of the hour. Dr. Jamie Kaufman is going to be talking about her book, Acid Reflux in Children, How Healthy Eating Can Fix Your Child's Asthma, Allergies, Obesity, Nasal Congestion, Cough, and Croup. This is very interesting. We talk about this all the time, and if you've been listening to this program for any length of time, this should come as no surprise to you, but most of the world doesn't know this. So Dr. Jamie Kaufman has a book called Acid Reflux in Children that is going to freak people out. They're going to be like, you mean my kid doesn't have to take Zantac? You mean my infant doesn't have to have pediatric Zantac that comes in a bottle because my baby can't swallow pills so she can get her Zantac in liquid form? How shocking. This Most people don't know this. Most people don't know that if you have heartburn, whether it's you as an adult or uh, a child, if you have acid reflux, you got a food problem. In fact, most people don't know that no matter what your health challenge is, probably somewhere down below, you've got a food challenge. That's why we talk about food and digestion so much on this program. I do not believe you can have a health program that does not focus on food and digestion. And it's not because I'm a foodie. It's because that's just where the rubber meets the road. It's where the inside world becomes the, or the outside world becomes the inside world. So it makes perfect sense that that's where all problems would begin. The importance of the digestive system when it comes to health is it's impossible to overstate. It's the core of it all. In Chinese medicine, they call it the triple burner, the center of your belly. When you're a kid playing basketball, they tell you, focus on the center, focus on the belly. Belly doesn't lie. So we've been talking about stomach acid, importance of stomach acid for digestion. Dr. Kaufman's going to be talking about too much stomach acid, I imagine. Hopefully she, she won't give you the party line. We talked to Dr. Kaufman before. Anyway, uh, if you have GERD, esophageal reflux disease, it's not a question of too much acid. It's a question of a loose sphincter. It's a sphincter problem, and ironically, because the sphincter tightens in the presence of acid, sometimes too little stomach acid can actually be the cause of, of, uh, of acid reflux. Acid plays a role in nutrient absorption. Acid plays a role in killing bacteria and pathogens, microbes. And acid plays a role. Stomach acid plays a major role in the health of the digestive system downstream. Acid in the stomach, or the lack thereof, is going to affect the digestive system at the level of the pancreas, at the level of the gallbladder, at the level of the liver, and at the level of the intestine, the small and the large intestine. So acid 
it, it's impossible to overstate how important this is at the level of the stomach because not only are you going not going to be able to absorb vitamin B12 and your minerals, not only are you going to be at higher risk for bacterial infections, but you're not going to be functioning, your, your digestive system isn't going to be functioning maximally downstream. Quick digression on acid. Acid is measured on a pH, uh, on a scale, they call it the pH scale, 0 to 14. 0 to 7 is the acidic side, 7 to 14 is the non-acidic sign, technically the alkaline sign or the basic sign. Acid is like a, vac is like a uh, fountain, alkaline is like a vacuum. Acid throws, uh, acid throws energy out, alkaline sucks energy in, and they go together throwing out and sucking it in. That's why you have acid base. As, I think of acids like a fountain, a stream of energy, Electri uh, electrical energy, by the way. Acids are made up of two parts. You've got a positive part and you've got a negative part. Positive part in an acid is technically just hydrogen. The negative part, that's the electrolyte. And how fast the electrolyte, the electrical part, jumps off the hydrogen, that's how strong your acid is. So chloride and sulfate, they split off really super readily, and that's why hydrochloric acid and high, uh, sulfuric acid are such powerful acids. If, it's, if the stuff splits off quickly, you've got a really strong acid. So 0 to 14 is your, is your acid scale. Basically 0 to 7, or the lower numbers, mean you're throwing off energy. Stomach acid's got a pH of 1.5 to 2. That's pretty darn acidic. That means it's throwing off energy. The stomach acid is throwing off energy really quickly, and obviously you need that because that throwing off of energy helps break down foods. That throwing off of energy also, by the way, electrifies foods. It makes foods more electrical. That electricity in the foods creates this energy that liberates everything. That's how acids work to liberate vitamins and, and uh, pro, uh, proteins and other nutrients from the food. Stomach acid, this is, I'm, I'm getting into the weeds here, I know, but just uh, the bottom line here is stomach acid's important stuff. And as I say, stomach acid is important for uh, what's going on downstream, especially around bile secretion and especially around uh, the small intestine. There's a condition called SIBO, which you haven't, if you have not heard, you will start to hear. It's, it's pretty much set to be the fashionable disease of the, of the week. Every week there's a fashionable, or every year there's a fashionable disease state. SIBO is soon to, and my, uh, my prediction is, SIBO is soon, soon to unseat gluten intolerance as the latest fad disease. It's, it's really not a disease, it's a condition, and most people have a degree of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, just like most people have a degree of gluten intolerance. So anyway, this condition SIBO, this small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, it can be a real nightmare for folks especially around gas and bloating. If you have gas and bloating after you eat certain foods, pretty much you, you can rest assured you've got some degree of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, especially if you find that uh, after you eat starchy foods or sugary foods, dried fruit, things that have high concentrations of sugar, if you get gassy or bloaty after that, um, or you have bowel, problem, uh, bowel movement problems after that, pretty much you can rest assured you're dealing with a, a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, some degree of it. SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, can also lead to acid reflux, uh, GERD. The, the, uh, the, uh, the disease state that you would take Zantac or Tagamet or an antacid for can, can be backtracked sometimes at least to SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. These bacteria make gases, and these gases create a pressure upward that can result in uh, acid being expelled through the sphincter that connects up to the esophagus. Under ordinary circumstances, when food is in the stomach and acid and enzymes are sloshing about in the stomach as the body attempts to digest the food, this sphincter, it's called the lower esophageal sphincter, or the LES, it connects the uh, stomach to the esophagus, it's supposed to stay shut. When, you're, when your stomach is sloshing around, crunching up the food, doing all of its food grinding and secretion of juices, this makes sense. The sphincter is supposed to say, stay shut. If you don't have enough stomach acid, 
the sphincter will loosen up. If you have SIBO, the sphincter can get, uh, can get forced open by the pressure. You can see how too much stomach acid is not necessarily the problem if you have acid reflux. All right, I'm Pharmacist Ben, 844-236-6010 is our number. We'll come back with your phone calls and more good health information on the bright side right after this. Okay, we are back on the Bright Side. I'm Pharmacist Ben. Please check out our websites, brightsideben.com and pharmacistben.com and criticalhealthnews.com for all the longevity products. You can do, uh, you can check out our archives also if you miss a program and you can search for particular subjects, topics that you may have missed at benfuchsarchives.com and brightsideben.com. And of course, you can also click on the join the team link at brightsideben.com, pharmacistben.com or criticalhealthnews.com if you want to start a young Longevity business. If you're a health-minded person, if health uh, if supplementation has helped you or a loved one in your life, and you want to pay it forward, if you like being in the health business, if you're looking for a business to start, if you're an entrepreneur, check out the Longevity business opportunity at uh, by clicking on the join the team link at brightsideben.com, pharmacistben.com, or criticalhealthnews.com. For a one-time $25 fee, you can be in business for yourself. You can also call 866-735-2470. 866-735-2470. Also want to remind you to check out our Truth Skin Health products at truthtreatments.com. Truth Retinol 5% gel made with vitamin C and retinol in our transdermal delivery matrix. And that's it. No preservatives, fragrances, fillers, waxes, emulsifiers. Nothing your skin doesn't need or doesn't want in any of our Truth Treatment products. You can check them all out at truthtreatments.com, truthtreatments.com. Got Dr. Jamie Kaufman coming up at the bottom of the hour talking about acid reflux in children. We will take your calls in this segment at 844-236-6010, 844-236-6010. Uh, and let's say good morning to Richard in Florida. What's up, Richard? Hey, Ben. Um, I was calling because my sister was just diagnosed with AVM. It's arterial venous malformation. I'm sorry, brain. you're cutting out there. Uh, AVM, you said? Yes, AVM. Oh, okay. And um, they're planning on doing uh, a, a prom planning on doing radiating the area to basically cauterize the problem spot. And uh, I know there's a risk of hemorrhage brain hemorrhage and all that. What I was asking for, because I started reading the book by Tom, Dr. Tom Levy that you recommended, Primal, Prim uh, primal Panacea. Primal Panacea. Yeah. And uh, I wasn't sure if high doses of vitamin C would help. It wouldn't hurt. Least. Yeah. But yeah, it wouldn't hurt. Any other... Mm -hmm. uh, you know, once the blood, once they're all tangled, uh, AVM for the listeners is basically just a tangle of, of circulatory vessels in the brain. Um, and usually when that happens, uh, the brain, when you have like uh, out of control blood vessel growth, it has to do with the fact that the body's trying to get oxygen, the brain's trying to get oxygen. So it's very possible that uh, the tangles are caused by a lack of oxygen to the brain. They can, of course, also cause a lack of oxygen in the brain. That's why they got to do something about it. Once they're tangled up like that, uh, I don't know necessarily that you're going to be able to handle it nutritionally. I can't say yay or nay. It doesn't sound like you would be, and maybe that she does need to do that. However, what she should be doing, uh, once she does have the procedure done, which is definitely a, a serious procedure, uh, she needs to be making absolutely positively sure she's taking care of herself at, after that. How old is she? She's uh, 58. Okay. Smoker? No. Any, uh, any other health challenges that she's dealing with? No. I mean, she's had a out of, of cancer in the past. Uh, okay, well, yeah, that's that sounds like a health challenge. Uh, here's the deal. Cancer is also caused by lack of oxygen. Sounds like long-term uh, long chronic inflammation, and I'm guessing that starts at, uh, more than likely it's going to start at the digestive system level, but it just sounds like she has a mm -hmm. chronic, uh, chronic inflammatory condition going on in her body. That means that okay. the body's in a, that means the body's in a constant defense mode. That would cause the tangles for sure. It would cause the cancer for sure. She's got to have other things going on. I'm not saying that to be mean or to pick on her. I'm saying that because those represent places that she can have, she can observe her, uh, 
how effective her protocols are. If she gets better, if she notices her symptoms and then her symptoms improve, she knows she's on the right track. She can doctor herself. But first, you got to see, right. you got to spot problems so you know how to, how to uh, you have a, a, a diagnostic tool for yourself. You got to be able to spot problems so you know if you're improving or getting worse. If you don't know you have any problems, you don't have a diagnostic tool. You can't see if you're getting better or worse. You follow me? So I'm not picking yes, on her. So you just got to find these things. So if she had a, has a history of cancer, there's got to be other things going on. These things do not occur in a vacuum. AVM does not occur in a vacuum. It's a sign of long-term issues. And that means that she's probably missing things. Not, again, I'm not beating her up or beating you up, or, you know, trying to be mean. I'm just saying these represent no. places to look. Okay? So I'd be starting okay. off with, I, I'd be pounding nutritional supplements, especially vitamin C. Anything for the blood vessels, magnesium, uh, bone broth, using bone broth protein, uh, the Mighty 90, of course, ultimate EFAs. That goes without saying. I get her on the Healthy Star Pack. I'd be sipping on the Beyond Tangy Tangerine. I might want to throw in some Fucoid Z and some niacin. And the chances are pretty good if she's a standard American. I'm assuming she says she sounds like a standard American that her blood sugar's off. So she probably wants to start working with that. And then don't underestimate cortisol lowering. And that comes from not just supplementation, but also things like slow, deep breathing, slow, deep rhythmic breathing, SDR breathing, as I call it, uh, relaxing the body, mental and emotional strategies. I mean, you don't want to focus on the AVM. The doctors will focus on the AVM because they get paid for that. They get paid to be specialists. Only people who care about special issues and special diseases, I should say, are specialists because that's how they get paid. But AVM and cancer are part of a syndrome of the body in duress. It's called duress syndrome. I just made that up. That's basically what it is. It's duress syndrome. A syndrome is a bunch of symptoms that all fall under one umbrella problem, uh, like metabolic syndrome falls under the umbrella problem of, of blood sugar issues. The syndrome, leaky gut syndrome, all the symptoms fall under the umbrella of a, of a leaky gut. She has duress syndrome. That means the body is in duress. Calm the body down with supplements, eliminating problem foods, and mo uh, mental and emotional relaxation strategies. Hey, I got, I got a couple more calls I want to get to. I hope I helped you out okay. there, Richard. Thank you yes, so much, buddy. Thank you. Okay, Mary in Missouri, what's going on? Good morning. What's up? Ben, do you, hi, Ben, do you have an opinion of uh, angioprim? It's a product for hardening of the artery. Yes, I know about angioprim. Um, it's basically uh, amino acids. Key, it's a chelating, a chelating product. Use, use N-acetylcysteine. Save your money on the angioprim. Use N-acetylcysteine. And anything with sulfur and selenium, for that matter. That's what I would do. Angioprim's okay, but it's just pricey amino acids. I'm going to get one right. more call in, Mary. Hope I helped you out. Thank you so much. Mike in New York, you get the last word, at least until we talk to Jamie Kaufman at the bottom of the hour. What's up, Mike? Mike, Mike? Uh -huh. Hey, Mike. Am I on? You are on, but you got about 30 seconds or 60 seconds. Oh, I apologize. Yes. No, anything about sebaceous gland prominence on the genitals, like penis area, and would that be about skin? Uh, the same uh, things you apply to other skin, or is that? Yeah. It's skin. That's exactly right. It doesn't matter where it is. It's just skin is skin is skin. Uh, you might, do you have any other skin? Is it for you? Oh, uh, yes. Any other skin issues? Um, yes. I think I, from your research, I think I have liver acne as uh, well. I would be guessing, yeah, I, it sounds like when you have sebaceous issues, either sebaceous hyperplasia or any sebum issues, uh, first thing you want to focus on is insulin and testosterone okay. and insulin, those two. So I'd be working on the blood sugar. Uh, yeah, do you have I'm a, dim, is that okay? Or I'm sorry, taking what? Dim. Dim. Okay, oh, that's okay, but it's not going to change your life or anything. I know quite a bit about okay. dim, actually. Diendoleal methane. No, I'd be working on the blood sugar and the food, and look for other symptoms. You probably have other things going on. Chances are uh, they involve the blood sugar system and the digestive system. Those are the two places I would work with any sebaceous issues. Sebum, uh, hypersebaceous uh, activity, too much sebum, or hyper uh, sebaceous pla uh, hyperplasia, sebaceous hyperplasia, uh, which is another sebum condition or se sebocyte condition. And right, pharmacist Ben, 844-236-6010 is our number. You're listening to the... Okay, we are back on the Bright Side. Thanks for joining us. We're on the air Monday through Friday, 8 to 9 Pacific and 10 to 11 Central Time and 24-7 on the archive pages at BenFuchsArchives.com and BrightSideBen.com. You'll find the longevity products. 
uh, on all our websites and the join the team link, a uh, join the team now link that you can click on at brightsideben.com, pharmacistben.com, and criticalhealthnews.com. And don't forget to check out our skin health products at truthtreatments.com, truthtreatments.com. All right, so I am very excited to have our next guest on. We've talked to her in the past. Dr. Jamie Kaufman is an well, she's a she's a clinical professor of otolaryngology at the New York uh, Eye and Ear Infirmary, but that's not what we're going to talk about here today. We're going to talk about acid. Her first book was called Dropping Acid. We had her on a, I, oh, probably a couple of years ago. Her new book is Acid Reflux in Children. Dr. Kaufman's got a really interesting take on the connection between the digestive system and the respiratory system. Please welcome to the Bright Side, Dr. Jamie Kaufman. Hey, Doc. Hey, Ben. So nice to talk with you again. Good, nice, uh, very nice to talk with you again as well. I have a particular uh, a problem with acid ref uh, how we treat acid reflux in children via the medical model. Uh, as a pharmacist, I was always blown away by the, 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 the just seemingly biochemical stupidity of giving a baby Zantac or Tagamet, liquid Tagamet, pediatric or, Tagamet. So or worse, Prilosec. Or Prilosec, these acid inhibitors in babies, literally infants who are just home from the hospital. So your book caught my attention, but you also have some other things, very interesting, interesting things to say about a, a kind of unusual connection. I hadn't heard this connection before between the between heartburn and the respiratory tract. So uh, once you get into this, uh, well, first of all, why don't you talk about acid reflux in children real quick, and then we'll get into the idea of the relationship between heartburn and the respiratory system. Well. You know, let me just make a, a couple of very important points that I think are essential to why I, I do what I do. Um, the term respiratory reflux is a new term, and it means that there's backflow of acid and stomach contents and, and enzymes and whatever's undigested uh, up into the respiratory tract. So everybody knows about heartburn and esophageal problems and esophageal cancer and reflux. Everybody knows about that. But what they don't know, and physicians, that includes physicians, is that the reflux occurs often at night in the respiratory tract. So once it comes up into the throat, the throat is like Grand Central Station, and it can go on the vocal cords. It can go in the nose and the sinuses. It can go in the, in the trachea and cause the bronchitis and tracheitis, and it can go in the lungs. So my experience now spans 40 years. I estimate that I've seen roughly 200,000 patients in my lifetime with respiratory reflux. So, so, so you're actually... The, the diagnosis is respiratory reflux. That's an official diagnosis now? Yes, and the term that I, I introduced all the terms, the first term was laryngopharyngeal reflux, and the larynx and the pharynx are the voice box in the throat. The problem with laryngopharyngeal reflux, or LPR, is it's a mouthful and it's not very intuitive for people who aren't physicians. Mm. So that's when respiratory reflux came along. And so that term has now been in use about three years. And so we divide it into two types of reflux, esophageal reflux. Those are the people who have heartburn and indigestion. And people who have respiratory diseases have respiratory reflux Is if they have reflux. And I'll give you a quick example before we start talking about the, the nuts and bolts. A um, young woman worked for me, had a seven-year-old child with asthma, and I was getting calls at least once a month. I'm going to be in late. We were in the emergency room last night um, with my child's asthma. So in discussions with her about her uh, diet and the child's diet, I realized the child was getting um, chocolate milk and ice cream before bed every night. <laughs> and I said to her, uh, the dinner finishes early, like 6 o'clock, and then there's homework, uh, reading, bath, television, and no more food um, before bed. And uh, the child's asthma went away. You're a miracle worker, I bet they thought. It well, sounds like a miracle. Yeah. It just, it's, it's not, common sense. It's not a miracle. It's I, got, I get that. I, I get that, but it sounds to most people miraculous because why wouldn't she think 
ahead of time, hey, maybe it's something the kid's eating, but we don't think that way as a culture. So when somebody comes along and says, stop the chocolate milk, and the ice cream in the prom goes away, it sounds miraculous. By the way, is snoring and apnea, sleep apnea, are they related to this uh, respiratory reflux condition? Let me make a comment to you that's even broader since I'm old. Um, when I grew up, my mother put dinner on the table at 6 o'clock. Um, there were no fast foods. There were no soda machines. All the foods came local, even the chickens. Um, we went out to eat um, once a month, usually to Valley Steakhouse or, or for Chinese food. And, um, and uh, in those days, there was uh, very little obesity. There might have been this little one, a fat guy. Um, there was no diabetes. Uh, there was no esophageal cancer, there was no asthma. I mean, all of these diagnoses were uncommon. And today, our children, um, they're born mostly healthy, but by age three, almost all of our kids have something. I mean, go to a playground and listen to the kids with hoarse voices, snotting, coughing. Mm. And so Mm. you recognize that the... um, uh, something big has changed. And what's happened is the American diet has changed in the last 40 years. 40? How about the last 100? Well, it wasn't so bad when I grew up in the 60s. I mean, but how, now... How, 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 it's changed a lot, though, from our evolutionary past, how we used to eat in the last 200 years, 100 years. I think we used years. to be... You know, we used to be... You know, we were, we, we, we were plant eaters. Yeah. Um, For the most uh, part. I personally... I'm vegan, uh, by the way. And, we um, ate meat, I, though. I, we ate no, meat. I, I mean, ev- meat. no, no. I'm saying from an evolutionary perspective, they people ate meat, but it wasn't as much. That was harder to find. Meat certainly wasn't like they every didn't meal. They eat meat very often. They were mostly. I mean, if you go back and read the Naked Ape by Desmond Morris, which I read recently and found fascinating. Yeah. Um, we we were pretty much um, a vegetarian, and the hunting came later. Um, as weapons developed, and uh, the weapons were developed also to protect the tribe, and it was complicated. But um, uh, if you look at all the biggest animals, I mean, uh, the gorilla and the giraffe and the elephant and the rhino, all these are, are vegetarian, actually. But they have they have special digestive systems that allow them to eat the, all that grass and, and foliage, no? No, they don't. They have the same digestive system we do. Okay. All right. So how about the only uh, grass eater? By the way, the only the, the only the only exclusive grass eater is the Canada goose, and we got them lots of them on the golf courses now. Okay. So back to the th- the whole idea with children. Is this uh, uh, these conditions that you're talking about? This these affect children as well as adults, and uh, I'm, like things like allergies, obesity, uh, asthma, autoimmune disease. Would you say that that's all related to to the uh, to this whole notion of respiratory uh, respiratory reflux? Absolutely. Let me just make a too. comment. In adults, about half of adults have what we call silent reflux. And the term silent reflux means um, you don't have heartburn or indigestion. You don't know you have reflux. Most Doc, of that's, those that's, people... we got to take a break. Hang on. That's a great, uh, that's a great concept. I, I want to talk about that when we come back. Don't go away. I'm Farm Suspend. You're listening to The Bright Side. We're talking to Dr. Jamie Kaufman. Her book is Acid Reflux in Children. We'll be back right after this. On the bright side, I'm pharmacist Ben. We're talking to Dr. Jamie Kaufman about her book Acid Reflux in Children. Before we went to break, you were, uh, Dr. Kaufman, you were, uh, you start talking about something called silent reflux. I have a friend who's constantly clearing his throat. Any relationship there? You think? Number one symptom of silent reflux is too much throat mucus and chronic throat clearing. Number one. Number one. I, um, I suspected. So. So let's just talk about silent reflux and then get back into the relationship between um, what's happening in kids and what's happening in in, in adults. So about 50% of adults have silent reflux. They don't never have heartburn a day in their life. But these are the people who um, they skip breakfast, they have a sandwich for lunch, they eat some kind of, you know, uh, not health food snack. And then they, uh, they they leave work at 6, and then they go to the gym, and then they have other activities or shopping at child care. And at 8.30, they're making their dinner, and they're refueling for the day. 
And then they finish dinner and they go on the sofa and they watch TV. They, then they get up to have some ice cream or uh, cookies or some dessert later, and then they go to bed. So all of those people reflux at night while they sleep. And during the night, the acid and enzymes uh, stirs up trouble, be it in the nose, throat, um, or even the sinuses um, and the lungs. And so uh, the three biggest misdiagnoses in America are allergies, sinusitis, and asthma. Um, for children, all well, of hang them on. are so, silent hang reflux. On. Doc, Doc, before you go, uh, so the three biggest misdiagnoses, allergies, sinusitis, and asthma, are you saying those are really silent heartburn or silent They're reflux? They're really silent reflux, yes. Right. Wow. Okay, and let me great. Tell, by the way, let me talk about asthma for a minute. If you know uh, if you have asthma or you have, know someone who has asthma, ask them this question: During an attack, do you have more trouble getting the air in to your lungs or out of your lungs? If you have trouble getting air into your lungs, it's reflux. Only trouble getting air out of the lungs um, is uh, actual uh, asthma. And by the way, reflux can stir up actual asthma as well. For almost 80% of people who have real asthma, lung, lung asthma, um, they also have reflux as a trigger. So reflux is huge, and respiratory what? reflux is bigger than, it's so big it's almost invisible. Okay, I want to get into kids, but I want to just really get to, I, don't, I want to make sure we get this point. In my opinion, and see, I want to see if you agree, reflux is a f- mostly a food condition. Correct. Okay, so it's food choices. If you have a reflux issue, your your this the, your most powerful leverage point is going to into dealing for dealing with it is going to be your food choices. Correct? No question. Okay, it's but awesome. But not only what you eat, when you eat it. So this How idea so? of a, so well, I had a guy who uh, ran a big restaurant here in New York, manager in Midtown. So at, at eleven o'clock, uh, he walked out of the, out the door. Um, and, and by midnight, he had gone home, had dinner, and gone to bed. And all we had to do to fix his reflux is to make him stop and eat dinner, be served dinner by his own staff at 5.30. And uh, you, so the late eat night too, eating is the number one risk factor for reflux. Gotcha. When you say timing, you're talking about late night eating. Right. Okay, got it. So between late night eating or eliminating late night eating and changing your food choices, your reflux should go away. Yeah, and in kids, uh, let's list some more symptoms. The cold that never goes away, um, recurrent croup, chronic throat clearing, raspy voice, poor sleep, chronic sore throat. And these, by the way, are kids the medicines don't seem to help. And so you might as well add, you know, problems with the tonsils and problems with the ears and the tubes because the reflux affects all of these areas. And uh, so... Uh, uh, diet is crucial. By the okay, way, so one of the big problems we have today is the generation of people that are having kids now grew up with fast food. Mm. So they're leaving soccer practice at 8.30, and they're stopping, you know, at, at some fast food restaurant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so, so uh, for, you've seen lots of kids with this condition, I imagine. What foods do you find are common triggers or foods that need to be eliminated? Just if you're going to rule a thumb, if you're going to eliminate certain foods, what, what would you say for kids? Well, there's another piece to this. Um, the, an- the answer is um, I-, I don't recommend milk for kids. Um, uh, when I was uh, uh, started, I have a farm in North Carolina where I have children and grandchildren. And I'd call my daughter-in-law, and she'd say, do me a favor, pick up a gallon of milk and two boxes of Juicy Juice. Well, that ship has long sailed. <laughs> the children now come, and they put their initials on a big plastic cup, and they go to the ice maker, and when we have dinner. So drinking water as opposed to uh, soft drinks, Um, and milk. And by the way, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends no juice for children under one and four ounces of less or less per day. Same here um, on this program. Big problem juices. So, so, so what your children drink is important. Um, Limit the fast food, limit the high fat foods, um, and be careful. Um, Sugar addiction is a big problem, but sugar is like a Trojan horse. They, they want the sugar. But all the fat comes with it. Um, trans fats are coming out um, of fast foods by law by, by the end of next year. Uh, it used to be loaded with trans fats. 
But so you want to start thinking about the idea of, you know, five servings of fruits and vegetables a day. You want to start limiting uh, red meat, the idea of, you know, a uh, cheeseburger and fries and, and a Coke is not, is not a meal um, that's healthy ever for anybody, really. So that you start thinking differently about food. Um, I personally um, uh, think that um, uh, taking your children to the grocery store is a really big event. And stay out of the middle of the store because all the good healthy stuff is usually around the periphery. Um, and so you want to they're gonna go, oh, I didn't know you, I didn't know you like grapes. Oh, you really <laughs> love bananas? Have you ever had an avocado and you make an av- avocado on toast with a little olive oil? And so you start your, with your child um, picking out uh, fruits and vegetables that he or she likes and involve your child in doing some cooking at home. And when you cook at home, never cook for one meal. If you're going to make something that's healthy, make a whole bunch of it. And it can be a leftover. Uh, it can be a, a snack. And, um, and and start to get uh, the junk food out of the house. So, you know, if you want to go out for ice cream and you go out for ice cream, don't have, a, a you know, two half gallons sitting in the in the freezer uh, at any, to be eaten at any moment. Um and, and, I, and I recommend uh, that parents to see the movies. There are two movies that I recommend, Forks Over Knives. They're on Netflix and you know, Amazon and such, Forks Over Knives and What the Hell. And so, you know, um, my own family started out, uh, my, meaning my children and grandchildren, and grandchildren, eating quite unhealthy. And over the course of the last five years, I've converted them. How about, uh, what's your take on fermented food and probiotics? Well, there's nothing wrong with probiotics. I mean, I think probiotics are fine. Um, I don't I'm, think I'm talking about for dealing with, I'm thinking for dealing with respiratory reflux. Well, I mean, a probiotic's not going to make respiratory reflux go away. I don't think any of the uh, naturopathic remedies have shown much. I mean, you know, we all look at, at data. Uh, of all the things that actually are sort of strangely helpful, um, uh, manuka honey uh, uh, seems to be. Manuka honey comes from New Zealand. It's a monoflower mm-hmm. bee, and manuka honey has been used by it was used by the Aborigines for centuries, maybe thousands of years. For reflux. And so, yeah. So we recommend the manuka honey lozenges. They're they're everywhere now. And having one of those after a meal for a sweet treat, um, hmm. and you suck on them, and you you actually make the reflux go away. You salivate apple? more, ha- you swallow ha- more. What? Have you heard about apples? What about apples? Have you heard about using apples for reflux? I don't think apples help reflux particularly. I don't think it harms them particularly, although I will say um, I certainly prefer red apples over green apples for refluxers. I have I've just heard kind of a wise tale, and people tell me about apples for for, uh, for reflux. So, uh, are you familiar with a condition called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, SIBO? Yeah, yeah. And is there a relationship between SIBO and reflux? That's that, that question. I don't think we know the answer to that question. We certainly know there's a relationship between fungal infection and reflux. Mm. So we 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 see um, candida, which is easily diagnosed by looking inside the throat or esophagus. You see these very characteristic white patches, um, and we we what we think happens is the acid and the enzymes kill the normal flora, and then the, the candida grows, which is the fungus. Hey, Doc, we're um, out of time. We're, we're out. Thank oh, you. That's no. a ton of great information. That's a ton of great stuff. Uh, Dr. Jamie Coppin, thank you so much. We'll have you back on. We'll talk about acid reflux in children some more. Her book is Acid Reflux in Children, How Healthy Eating Can Fix Your Child's Asthma, Allergies, Obesity, Nasal Congestion, Cough, and Croup. Thanks for listening to The Bright Side, friends. Have a wonderful, beautiful, awesome day. We'll talk to you all later. Bye for now.